Okay, the question is, how will you write the learner characteristics and prerequisites as general statement? So, first thing, learner characteristics and prerequisites go hand in hand. The moment you identify the learner characteristics, you will be able to tell the prerequisites for the course. That is why the learner characteristics is important. Now, in your case, since most of you will be starting off giving instructions to online courses to your own students, for the time being, a B.Tech, M.Tech classification is fine. But when you actually look at, so the idea is, are you offering the signals and systems for non-engineering students? Are you going to offer this for a global student? So where are you planning to offer the MOOC? Are you planning to offer the online course in your own institution? Then you do not have to worry too much. So you just have to tell the participants that whoever has a basic understanding of a particular so maths physics they are eligible to apply uh, with some better understanding about integration differentiation topics like these these are essential for the topic of signals and systems similarly each of your own course will have some kind of these prerequisites so you should look at the subject competency at first but if you are finding it difficult for the time being you can write btech CA students from my institution. I am going to offer this for online course for BTEC students from my institution and my colleagues' institution who are is your peer. So let's say you are from particular place, let's say Kolkata. All the electronics and communication students in the University of Kolkata will be my students. So this is sufficient to start off. Okay. So you th that is how the scoping is done. But when you look at global audience, look at skills and competencies that the learner is going to have. And there could be courses with no prerequisites also. That is perfectly fine. Okay. So let us now move to the second page. So for each of the topics that you have identified, you should write the learning objectives over here. So in case you have not written the learning objectives yet, you can start off writing the learning objectives. But what you have to additionally do while planning for material, so think of your own course. While you think about your own course, what you will think, okay, I am going to take this subject to this student and in my first week I will going to cover this, my students are going to do that. You will have some kind of idea like this, right? So first, write the learning objectives and to achieve the learning objectives, what the teacher will do and what the student will do. Okay, so this is part A of planning, but there is another part. Over here, now think of for achieving that particular teaching action and learning action, what kind of materials will I give? So let us say, take this example, signals and systems. I have my first topic as, uh, give me a topic in the uh, signals and systems. Introduction to basic signals. Okay, introduction to basic signals is my first topic. So you will write a learning objective for the basic topic here and you will specify what actions are going to be done by the teacher. So it may be that I am going to tell about basic signals, signal 1, signal 2, signal 3, basic signal 3, basic signals, then I will give an activity, then and I will then do a question, then I will make students discuss. So all these are the kind of actions you will think of when you think of a topic like this. But I want you to classify them as what actions are going to be done by the teacher and what actions are going to be done by the student. Now you are thinking of an online course. In an online course, what will the teacher do? What will the student do? After doing that, identify the category of materials. So what do you mean by category of materials? The medium. So to tell about a basic signal, I will give a video. So video is the category of material. To ensure that learners understand this particular topic, I would do a question, assessment question. So question, a multiple choice question is a category. It could be open ended question or multiple choice question. So there are these multiple categories that you can come up with. So list out all those categories in planning the material. So you are now planning the materials that you will have in your online course. So if you are not aiming for a massive open, at least look for online course within your institution, least. 
So you can start this activity now, uh, roughly around 10 minutes for doing this. So you just have to do it for two topics, huh? you do not have to do for the entire course, your entire course will have, the four week course will have lots of topics, in that you just have to look at two topics, okay. You do not have to do for the entire course, entire course is four or five topics, you are just going to do for two topics. So, uh, what we really want you to do now is in the topics where you have to uh, decide whether you will teach it using a video or lecture, try to find one topic or subtopic for each type of format, each type of medium. What teachers will do, what students will do, enter, enter categories of materials you will use for teaching action. So, some small subtopic and one of it which we will be able to teach via video, one via an example, one via an activity, just try to get to that point and then we'll go to the next step. So when I say video, I mean it can, you, it's an online course, right? So with the PPT, you have to have some voice or something. A video need not be just the instructor's face. It can be a screenshot plus a narration. How many of you have identified at least one topic and one set of activities? How many groups? Okay, so by activities, activity could be videos, assessment questions, analysis, online quizzes, all these are activities. So one teacher activity, one student activity. All of you have done for one topic? Okay, so uh, let me now just go ahead to the next one, so we are going into the concept of chunking, okay. So the worksheet is going to come now, but think of this, you will have to now reorient. So you have identified videos and uh, activities, right. Now think of the key concepts that you are going to address in that particular topic and see whether you have associated materials for the key concepts. So for the same topic, you can have more than one key concepts. So this is just to identify how long or how short your material is, okay. So identify the key concepts. So if you remember the chunking principle, the principle stated that do not create long lecture videos or continuous text, instead chunk them. And what is chunking? Identify blocks of information around a key concept. So now you have to identify this key concept around which your teacher activity or student activity will be designed. So identify that smallest unit concept. Okay, so uh, once again clarifying by chunks, so it may so happen that some of you have already chunked your topic such that there is only one key concept. So then you are good to go because we are looking at the length of each concept. Like if you can explain a particular concept under 10 minutes in a video, you are fine. So it, but there are some concepts, so I went through some of the topics that you have selected. In some of the topics, there are multiple key concepts that are being explained. So it may require more than one video. You may more than one video. So it is to identify this unit element that you would require 
this chunking process. So the key concepts, the focus has to be around the key concepts. This is just, most of you would have done the step 4 already. I mean you would have had this in your mind already, but it is important that you list down the flow, like what is going to come, how it is going to flow, your online course, how is it going to flow, just think how it will, for that particular topic, is it, I explain this concept, then students will do an activity. Then I will explain the next concept, students will do an activity, just reiterate on that and ensure that you have the flow and the sequence of materials correct. Because if you want to follow the sequencing principle, it is important that you do not repeat the same type of learning activities, but instead vary them. You will have to look at the teaching learning activity and the sequence of materials, both will have a bearing on how much engaged your student would be. You cannot have video, 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 nor you can have problem, 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 problem. There should be a healthy mix, exactly, but it should have a flow also and it should tie to your objective. So do this for at least one topic. So you will have a sequence of activities with you. How many of you have completed chunking? How many groups have completed chunking? Okay, please go ahead and do the sequencing. Okay, how many of you have not done the sequencing? How many of you have not, so people who have completed chunking, have you done the sequencing? Yes, okay. So I think by this time most of you will have a sequence of videos and activities with you, correct? What other things have you put other than videos and assessments, what other things have you included? Reflection spot. Okay, LEDs uh, will contain reflection spot, so quizzes, other than these, so other than uh, by assignment, what do you mean? So open ended assignment or uh, multiple choice questions, what kind of assignment? So open ended assignments, where they have to write a lot, okay. Project. Worksheet also given for one of the project. Okay, worksheets provided along with one of the projects. Additional reading materials. Handouts. Video cases. Yeah, it is again another type of video. Okay, what else? See, all of you have to imagine of a student accessing the course in a mobile or in a computer. So. How will the student do it? Is it through multiple choice questions or through some going to a particular website visiting it or is it some activities, some animations already embedded in it in the learning platform? How are they going to do it? Think of activities from that perspective. Yeah. So application where we can use this thing in a particular industry or particular uh, task. Okay, so they are going to write out the answer? No, no, we will give that this can be applied in this task. Okay. It, then they will do that, that how to the, solve the task. So what will they do for solving? Are they going to write out the answer or? Yeah, they can write out the answer. So it's more or less like open ended answering that somebody has done over here. Okay. Any other categories? Any other categories? Yeah. We can give them some problem statement on which they can create some small content. But they can they themselves create their own video making some experiment and upload. Okay, like so that. this is this is another category where you, the learner creates something. So it is equivalent to your resource creation assignments that you are familiar in the FDP. Okay. Any other categories? 
after the videos like to yeah i understood that so yeah. is it implemented as multiple choice questions or is it implemented as where no, they write it, it, it will down it will be like multiple choice okay yeah. so that category has so it is where somewhere the student gets engaged so the essence is that most of you have included places where teacher is telling something student is doing something and there are also additional things that students have to do beyond assessments okay like extra readings learning do, material PPT. learning materials download learning materials peer assessment has anybody done a discussion forum yet okay collaboration so discussion forum and other things is something that you can think of at this point yeah let's take a one step back and see where we are so far uh, we have we we thought of what the mooc is about the topics we have done what subtopics so we're still in fair amount into content we've decided the pieces for content we have done some sequencing we've decided okay there'll be an activity there'll be some video some assessment we're sort of there in our course planning so if you now recall the course planning task we're back to this slide you remember this where we had listed a bunch of decisions during course planning so here one of the important things we think of as instructors is this assignment, projects, homework, activities, assessment, some things that the teacher poses a question to the learner. So there, there's a loop here. The teacher poses some sort of question. The learner or group of learners do it together and they have their answers or their responses and the teacher provides feedback on it. Typically, this is the sequence. Right. So this is what we want to think about and plan a little bit that how to plan assignments and assessment in a MOOC and how do you make sure that students indeed learn from these. So if you think of assessment, uh, there are multiple reasons why we give assessment. Right? Why do we assess students? I'm going off a little bit into digression, but what are the reasons or various to see if they follow something. Okay. To check if objectives are met. So there are multiple reasons. One is for the teacher herself that I had planned that this is what my students should get at. Are they there? Has a student understood something? And then the more pragmatic reason also is that we have to grade them, we have to give them some score, some rank, some rating and so on. So we are not looking at the last part too much right now. We are looking at the parts where we do assessment to for them to see if they've understood it, for us to monitor their progress and so on. So back to activity for you. You've all taken the FDP course or ET601TX, some course you've taken, right? So list various types of assignments, assessment questions that you that you recall from that course. Spend one minute on a list, one minute swapping and making a bigger list. In and this is the IITBX platform. So you are now in a MOOC, you are a learner of a MOOC. Let's just Shout out, we'll write it. What are the different types, different formats of assignments or assessment questions you've seen in IITBX as a learner? Knowledge quiz. So when you say knowledge quiz, now let's get a little bit more into it. What is a knowledge quiz? What's the format of a knowledge quiz? It's a multiple choice question. Uh, if you have a multiple choice question, is a single answer correct or multiple answers? You can have both. Okay. So you have knowledge quizzes. Let's write that. Knowledge quiz. And this is essentially MCQs with either single or multiple correct answers. So this is one format. Okay. What other formats have you seen of? Uh, okay. What's a reflection quiz? So yeah, this is a question related to discussion forum. A simulation quiz, what is that? Let's also look at the purpose. So this is also questions related to what? 
what is an LXI? It's okay if you're related to some additional resources. So when you say related to, what's the purpose of this question related to additional resources? It's related to it, but why are we asking those assimilation quiz questions? For the learner to understand if they've gone through it or not. Okay, so okay, excellent. Related to additional resources. Summative assessment was in the form of what? Summative assessments, yeah, what is the format of it? Summative assessment usually is something, you, again you were back to multiple choice questions. Were there any non-multiple choice questions? Okay, so you may have true, false questions. What else? Was there any long answer questions? Open-ended questions? What is an RCA? I'm, I was not a learner in that course, right? So I don't know. <laughs> so, okay. So these were uh, resource creation. Resource creation activities, okay. Act assignments or activities. And this was in the form of upload a file, right? Or upload links, description or a file. Yeah, we, so we are looking at the purpose, the pedagogical purpose as well as the format using the technology. Anything else you recall? There were exit and, okay. So there were exit survey, I'll just put it like that. Question, we are still missing one or two important ones. All of these you did individually, right? What about OER? You created resources. OER creation was in resource creation activity. You did that in a group. So there were group activities and you submitted a single file. Okay. Same domain. Okay. Some of these were group. Peer review. You did peer review. That was one type of activity you did. You had peer review. Then um, you had some discussion forums also. Yeah. They were also, there were assignments you can call it. Discussion forums based on focused question. I think that was about it. I have a question for you. Were there any questions you saw which were not in text format? Which was not verbal? Were there any images in the questions or were they mostly verbal? Mostly verbal. So in fact IIT Bombay X and many other platforms do allow you to ask a question in the form of an image or give responses in the form of images. That's also there. So we have this whole list of assignments and assessments of various types, right? So we have called an assessment principle and since you have seen these various types, you will be able to relate it easily. The main thing is don't limit assessment to multiple choice questions. Multiple choice questions when well written can serve a useful purpose but they may not be sufficient to address all the learning purposes. The other reason this principle exists is because as soon as you say MOOC, everybody thinks of multiple choice questions. As a domain instructor, what other type of questions do you want to give in your subject? Drag and drop, yeah, you can do drag and drop also, yeah. Right, right. If you are teaching uh, electrical engineering, some course on signals and systems, what type of questions do you ask? Problems. There's a lot of problem solving in engineering and science uh, pro uh, questions. So where can you, in which type, in which format can you give problems? You, in resource creation, in open answer, you can actually have students type something. You can also create a multiple choice question out of a problem, but you can give the open problem and ask students to upload a file or give a text box and so on. And uh, from the domain perspective, you know that you need students to solve these kind of problems. If you are in social science, you may need them to write an argument or an essay about something, right? So this is the assessment principle. What is a problem in a massive open online course? If you give open-ended tasks, massive open online course. How do you grade it? No, there are so many. So there to tackle scale, what is recommended is that you use some format of peer review and performance rubrics. Okay, that's one way of doing it. You can also use self-assessment here with rubrics. 
Okay, let's uh, move on to one quick like seven minute do it yourself activity. You've identified the topic for which you want to create the LED and the video and all. So for that write one multiple choice question with choices. Okay, with let's say three to five choices, the actual text and one open ended question for the topic of your choice. You can do this individually or in pairs the way you, I think individually will work because even if you have the same topic, So, remember in the morning we said that sometimes you have to become a learner of a course and sometimes a teacher. So, right now for this activity you are wearing your teacher hat. So, now go back and become a learner in some MOOC. Okay. So, we are, you, we are at the stage assessment questions are there. Now, you are a learner. We are moving on to the next step. And as a learner you diligently answer all the questions in the quizzes. And for each of your answers, the feedback you get from the platform is, yes, you're right, or no, you're wrong. Or maybe you get a check or a cross. This is very typical, you know, it's the first thing. So will you be happy with such feedback? No, especially if it's... Yes, yeah. Some happiness, okay, no. Others? Neither happy nor unhappy. Say something. What about the others who didn't raise your hand? I know, okay, you need something more than just this. Okay, so the question is suppose, it's, it's not that saying yes you're right, no you're wrong is bad. That's not what it's asking. But what it's asking is what's wrong or what's not sufficient, let's rather than what's wrong, what is insufficient, let's ask that question. Okay, so what's insufficient if feedback said only yes or no? You had a question, you had a point earlier, yeah. If it is no, I would like to know why. So, why explanation is needed? What else? If it is fine, hmm? there's no one should have cancelled you want to answer right and okay. Okay, so how, how would you attempt to solve it again? <laughs> so, let's see, let's do one thing. Students who try to game the system, no, let's keep them out of scope right now because that's a whole a lot of energy has to be spent addressing those and it's really not worth it too much, especially in MOOCs where they come out of their interest and so on. Yeah. So again, that's why we said you're a learner, okay? You get feedback saying yes or no and he is unhappy because he doesn't know why he's wrong. So that's one thing you need. Hmm? Where you need improvement, how you need improvement. So if you're wrong, this is why you're wrong, but where do you, what do you do after that? Okay, so how to improve? How to improve, that's something you need. Anything else that you need? So when you're giving feedback, so now you're back to MOOC designers. So the main thing about giving feedback is uh, the feedback principle, which says that don't just say right or wrong, instead give constructive feedback that helps the learner to improve their understanding. Some of you said that. Utilize technology affordance to customize the feedback. So, one more thing that was insufficient with right or wrong is take a multiple choice question and B might be the right answer, A, C and D are wrong. So, the person who answers A is also wrong, the person who answers C is also wrong, but they may be wrong for different reasons. So, it goes back to why you are wrong. If you give stock feedback, the same uniform feedback for everybody, then the personalization is lost to some extent and that customization is required for better learning. So that's what this is saying, this principle is saying. So back to our usual question, how do I customize feedback for massive amount of massive number of learners? You can do that. So that's the first, so the zero step is simply saying, yes, you're right, no, you're wrong. One step more than that, you can say, look, this is the right answer. You figure out whether you're right or wrong. One step 
even more than that is to say well this is the right answer your answer is wrong for this reason and if you have only a finite number of choices you can customize feedback for each choice if you have a multiple choice question so this question suppose i give the answer as 4 so already even before doing anything before i answer it says here stuck watch a video or use a hint so there is some amount of feedbacks it's not personalized to every single of the 2000 learners but for learners who are stuck there is something given on the problem now i give an answer this was a question how many squares is this okay and suppose i check it tells me i'm not quite right encourages me says try again it tells me well if you want you can get help it tells me oh if you don't want you know you can skip this for now and you can do seven problems also if you want more practice so already different types of learners is sort of different feedback being offered by the system for different types of learners when you're designing a mooc it's desirable to think about at least some of these options for feedback go beyond right or wrong try to at least say this is the right answer for this reason but try to go one step further and say if you want help go here if you want prac do that maybe go back watch the video etc that's one way you can customize feedback the other thing you can do to apply the feedback principle is see the, the main thing is on constructive feedback that helps learner improve their understanding that's the key phrase here that's the purpose of feedback The other thing you can do is write performance rubrics with descriptions of levels. So this is something you've seen in your RCAs and OER assignments. So what's a rubric? It has descriptions of on very specific criteria. It tells you where you stand. We'll pull up an example a little later. So I think we can dive into do it yourself. For the assessment question, multiple choice question, you just wrote. design feedback for each option how many options did you have four three or four for each option what's the feedback you'll give so if a learner clicks a what will the system tell this is what the the mooc designer has to do Okay, at least you have written feedback for a few options, right? More than one option, two or three options. Good. So let's summarize the assessment and feedback principle in a learner-centric MOOC. And if you remember the LCM model, there were all these elements. The two elements we talked about now in the last half an hour are integration assignments. So as a MOOC designer, what you need to do is create integration assignments. which are open ended assignments for learners to apply knowledge or create resources plus a peer review okay we'll come to peer review in a moment and provide customized feedback so if you have learners answers in mcqs we just did an activity to see how to do feedback for every choice and if you have responses to integration assignments there is some peer review that has to be done So when you do peer review there are uh, many models of doing it and one model that we've used which you are all familiar with in the uh, FDP 201 and 101x are these rubrics so it looks like a table the main things in the rubrics are the rows and columns so the first column are the criteria on which this open ended assignment are being assessed So if you have a problem open problem or if you give a project to your students the first thing you'll have to do as a teacher is along which criteria are we giving feedback try to make these criteria focused okay and then for criteria you give say 3 to 4 levels a good rubric goes beyond saying poor fair good so if your rubric says poor fair good it's not very useful because 
my understanding of good and your understanding may be different. It has to explicitly say what does fair mean. So this is a rubric and these rubrics can be checked by peers who know the topic, who know the domain and so on. So uh, this sort of peer review is, this is one type of learning that peers can do with respect to each other. So peer review you have done, we will come back to peer review, but there are other kinds of learnings that can happen with peers. Some of you also said in the morning, there is a lot of benefits when peers talk to each other, when they give each other feedback, when they learn from each other. So list benefits of peers, very quickly, list and then we will put it together. Benefits of learning from peers and learning can be of different types. The peers can give review for each other, they can collaborate, they can answer doubts, give, clarify each other's doubts, they can dis, yeah. So peers can do all of this. So what are the benefits to the students when they do peer learning? Just think about a long list and then we will see. I have some here and then we will see yours. Okay, let's do the discussion in the following way. On the next slide, I have a partial list and you all have partial lists also. So what we'll do is first, each of you can look at the list that comes up here and see which one here you ha don't have in your list. You know, just see. So this is some benefits of peer learning and then I'll do the same thing in the opposite manner. So we're saying that peers communicate very well with each other. They, are, they relate to each other, they understand each other's language, they speak each other's, they use non-technical language to clarify doubts, whereas a teacher might use highly technical language. This is known to be a very huge benefit. How many of you had this? Couple of you. Yeah? So this is really very powerful because when you let students explain things to each other, they understand each other better than the teacher relates to them. Okay. When peers collaborate or discuss on a problem, especially an open-ended problem, they bring multiple perspectives, they share knowledge with each other. Okay, this is one more big advantage of peer learning and I think some of you had this, right? Share knowledge, okay. Share knowledge in multiple ways. Maybe I know something that you don't know or maybe you have a very new way of looking at it which I had never thought of if we are working on the same problem. And then we, peer review, here it claims on the slide that it benefits both the giver of the feedback and the receiver of the feedback. Do you agree? Who does it benefit more? Both? How? Yeah, in what way? Direction of thinking. Yeah, actually, you know, one of the first things peer review does is that it gives confidence to the learners that look, there is teaching and learning is two sides of the same coin. It's all about knowledge building. You know, I can build knowledge by giving feedback, I can build knowledge by getting feedback. How does the giver of feedback get benefit by doing peer review? So you can learn some new things from the answers you were saying? By clearing somebody else's doubt, by teaching something to someone, you can learn better. This is also a very well known fact, I think we all know it. Uh, how And the receiver of feedback? Change per receiver of feedback gets the usual benefits. Peer review using rubrics has one more benefit to the giver of feedback. So the rubric gives a criteria. There is a criteria, there is sort of an absolute target performance defined in the rubric. So the giver of feedback learns what that criteria is and learns how to evaluate actual answers against that criteria. Even by this exercise, there is some learning that happens. So any other points that were that are not in this slide which you had? Share knowledge you had, no? Someone said I'll put it here. Share knowledge. Any other points? Ben peer learning? Teamwork actually. Yeah, teamwork has 
just the knowing how to work in teams is also a good skill to build. Yeah. Yeah. So this thing, competition and collaboration. You no, know, there's a lot of debate on whether you should encourage both or only collaboration or only competition. There are pros and cons to doing both. So some people prefer to get students to work in a collaborative manner primarily. Some say, well, the competition will bring out more. There's a lot of debate on this. So be a little careful when you decide to say, I'm going to do it for the competitive reasons. Peer review can build up teaching ability among students. Teaching student. experience, yeah. Peer teaching ability among students. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For future. So peer review benefit to give or build. Actually, it's not only with peer review, of doing peer learning, peer teaching, peer learning, build teaching ability, agreed. Okay. There will be more investment in the cases. The whole is bigger. So multiple perspectives and big building towards a bigger knowledge. Yeah, so learn better from the whole thing. It's not just peer review, but by peer learning. Next question, where in the MOOCs you have seen so far, have you as a learner experienced peer learning? IITB X FDP 201 or 101. Where have you experienced peer learning? When you created OERs, okay. You, that was individual? RCA, resource creation, okay. When you create, collaborated on the resource creation task, then? All the resource creation activities, yeah. What else? Where else have you experienced peer learning? There were a few others. Discussion forums specifically the learning extension experience interactions. Remember those? Week one may have? Ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, introduce yourself. Tell us about the challenges you face in the technology, and then it said if you go further, it says go visit five other people and see what challenges they face. So if you come to the LCM MOOC model, the way to incorporate peer learning is to create learning experience interaction and peer review. Peer review is missing from this slide, but yeah, you can do peer review also. Yeah. So let's stop here. The main thing is don't rely only on teacher-centric dissemination of knowledge. It's not only the teacher who has all the knowledge. There's a lot of learning happening between peers. So design activities to exploit it. What kind of activities? LXI, peer review, and RCAs, and so on. Okay.